Good evening and welcome. Um, I'm Michael Pearson and I'm Executive Director of the Mathematical Association of America and along with the Carnegie Institute of Washington and Math for America DC we're delighted to be able to sponsor this um, special event tonight. This is also part of a series of lectures that we host, the Distinguished Lecture Series. Usually our lectures, the MAA's lectures, are a couple of blocks away at our smaller facility, the MAA Carriage House. The series is sponsored by the National Security Agency, and we really appreciate their continued support for these kinds of public events that bring the wonder of mathematics to a, a broader audience. So again, we really appreciate you being here. Um, there's going to be a, a couple of introductions tonight, and I would like to uh, first offer the floor to Maxine Singer, who's President Emerita of the Carnegie Institute, and also President of Math for America DC. Thank you. Thanks. I think I'll stay down here. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. For those of you who don't know where you are, and there may be a substantial number, the Carnegie Institution um, is a scientific research and education institute. And um, we're primarily focused on research um, in developmental biology, in plant biology, um, in planetary science and earth science, and astronomy, and astrophysics, and global ecology. Um, and all of those departments are kind of spread around the United States. Um, and I guess the ceiling here announces very clearly that the institution has been interested in the sky uh, since it was founded in 1902. Uh, those are actually really photographs uh, taken at the institution's um, observatory on Mount Wilson. Uh, which we no longer operate because of the light pollution in Los Angeles County. Uh, and about 1970, the trustees invested in 100 square miles of the Andes in northern Chile, and we have a large observatory there. The education programs are primarily focused um, in the departments on postdoctoral fellows who come for advanced training and to make use of the marvelous instruments that the institution owns because it has invested heavily in them. But here in this building, um, we pay a lot of attention to education in D.C. for science and math. And Math for America D.C. is one component of that. Um, the program of Math for America D.C. is to recruit nationwide young people primarily, but some not so young, um, who have undergraduate degrees in mathematics or a related topic, and who would like to become teachers in secondary schools. And Math for America provides them with a full scholarship uh, for a year of further study in mathematics and in education, um, and also a stipend. And in return, uh, they can teach for four years in D.C. public uh, secondary schools and public uh, charter schools. Uh, we have uh, now uh, 22 fellows, and we will have 30 uh, by, uh, by June. We're in the process of recruiting our next group. So uh, we find ourselves very much associated with mathematics, and uh, that's one uh, reason that we are now um, uh, cooperating in different ways with the Mathematical Association of America, who turn out to be our close neighbors as well. Um, so I am happy to have you all here on behalf of Carnegie and on behalf of Math for America, and I know we're going to have a marvelous evening. Thank you, Michael.
Thank you, Maxine. And it is indeed a pleasure for us, the MAA, to uh, work in collaboration with Maxine and the folks at Math for America and the Carnegie Institute to, to bring this event off tonight. And I would like to now pass the microphone on to Ivers Peterson, who is MAA's publisher, director of publications, and he will um, introduce the event for us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our, our presenters for tonight. Uh, you'll see the names on the, uh, on the screen already. Uh, David Kung is a professor of mathematics at uh, St. Mary's College of Maryland. He's originally from uh, Wisconsin, and even at about the age of four or so, he had a conflict between music and mathematics. Uh, he started violin then, but he was also very interested in puzzles, games, and all kinds of mathematical things, and that sort of continued through uh, the rest of his time. Uh, he did choose mathematics uh, as the career direction. He went to the University of Wisconsin uh, at Madison, and was there for both undergraduate work and then right into his graduate degrees. But he also did uh, not just a uh, research degree, but also one, uh, a minor in math education. And so he's also a very strong interest in, in, in education and communication in, in, in a broad sense. Um, he uh, then w ended up at St. Mary's College of Maryland, where he uh, has been for a number of years now, uh, and uh, thrilling his students with all kinds of interesting ways of, uh, of teaching and presenting mathematics, and is very strongly interested in communicating mathematics as widely as possible. And I think you'll get a sense of that tonight. Uh, for those of you who uh, want to continue learning more about what he does, uh, just coming out, you may have heard of something called Great Courses uh, under the uh, company called The Teaching Company. Well, he, this is a brand new one you probably haven't seen yet called How Mathematics and Music, How Music and Mathematics Relate. And uh, this has just become available and uh, is another uh, sort of an extension of a lot of the things that, that you'll hear about tonight. Uh, we also have with us Yvonne Carruthers. Uh, she's a cellist with the National Symphony Orchestra. She's been with the orchestra since 1978, which is a remarkable tenure. Uh, she uh, is from uh, the state of Washington originally. Uh, she uh, uh, did her music degree at the Eastman School of Music, uh, and then in the end ended up here in Washington for quite a long time. Uh, she's become uh, very uh, involved in communicating the wonder of music but music in, con in, in, con in combination with a lot of other things. So she's worked with the Smithsonian and other groups around the city and elsewhere, and, with, and certainly with the Kennedy Center, to present programs introducing uh, music with history, music with literature, music with science, music with mathematics. And uh, you can actually see uh, just earlier, um, uh, just a month ago, she did a program at the Kennedy Center, Connection Science and Music, uh, for an audience of, uh, for family audience, basically, uh, presenting a lot of uh, different interesting ideas about mathematics uh, and, and music together with, uh, with uh, some uh, very interesting science. Uh, then we have Aaron Goldman. He is, uh, uh, has been with the National Symphony since 2006. Just this month, he was named the principal flutist of the National Symphony Orchestra. And so uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> I think a, a significant promotion, I guess. So uh, I, he moves over one chair, I think. <laughs> so when you watch for him at the National Symphony Orchestra, you, you'll see him there. Uh, Aaron uh, is from the Massachusetts area, so you'll notice we're spanning the country here. He started off in Massachusetts. Um, he also went to the Eastman School of Music to study uh, and played in orchestras in Florida and, 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 and uh, some other places before he came to the National Symphony Orchestra. Uh, like Yvonne, he's very active in a lot of uh, chamber groups around town, has soloed with a lot of, uh, of uh, different orchestras in the area. Uh, he also has become very active in promoting flute uh, as a pastime. Uh, he is vice president of the Washington Flute Society. I'm sure I have those initials in the wrong order. And I, I need to put in a plug for something called the, the DC Flute Choir, which he runs and is open to anyone who is a member of the society and plays the flute. And they do interesting concerts and, and have an interesting time together. So we have an interesting group here to present to you uh, symphonic equations. Thank you.
thanks very much for coming. Um, I appreciate especially that you're coming on on, on a wonderfully uh, on a rainy night here in D.C. So thanks, thanks for coming out. Um, I, I thought I would tell you a little bit about how we got here because this is a, a bit of an unusual um, topic with an unusual crowd up here. So, um, so I have very mathematical parents, but my mom was also interested in music. She was a clarinetist and a pianist. Um, I, I got an early start, as Ivers mentioned. I know, I know, everybody's looking at the pants, I know. Um, <laughs> I started on violin very early at four years old, um, and it wasn't until I, I got my job at St. Mary's that I really combined these interests. Um, this is Richard Stark, who was the chair of the math department at St. Mary's when I interviewed for the job. In fact, the very first question I was asked when I interviewed for the job in mathematics as a math professor at St. Mary's, he leaned over the table, he's, this, he's a shorter Austrian gentleman, and he said, so, I see you play the violin. Can you play the Bach Chacon? <laughs> that was my introduction to St. Mary's College. Um, but I've since uh, combined my interest in mathematics and music in a number of different ways. I teach a first year seminar in math, music, and the mind. And the great courses, the uh, lectures that Ivers mentioned are just out from the, great, from the, the teaching company. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. And then... I heard on the radio, I heard a, a WAMU story that there were people from the National Symphony doing talks about mathematics and music. And, uh, you know, with the title, um, Math and Music, Closer Than You Think. And, um, and well, I had to admit, I, I already thought they were about, like, epsilon apart. But, um, <laughs> but they were, and so I wanted to know what was going on with them. And so when I got in contact with them, um, and then got in touch with Ivers about doing this, the, they were willing to join me on stage. So... Thank you guys so much for joining me on stage. Um, I, I think maybe we have two world-class musicians here. You want to hear a little bit from them? Yes. All right. Thanks very much. Aaron, did you want to share what that was? Yeah, sure. That was uh, a movement of the jet whistle. It's called Jet Whistle by uh, Third Year Lords. Excellent. Very nice. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in D.C. We're in D.C. giving this talk, and, um, well, D.C. is a place where people make promises and then work really hard to make sure you think they worked hard to try to keep them, right? So... <laughs> So we do have a couple of promises for you today. Uh, we've planned a, a sort of performance talk that lasts somewhere around 65, 70 minutes, and we hope we have some time for questions um, at the end of that. So that's one promise. Um, I think we can promise something for everybody. And I know there's a diverse audience here. So who's coming from the math side? Who are the math, the math folks? Excellent. It's great to see you. Uh, who's coming sort of more from the music side of things? There was some overlap there. That's great. Um, <laughs> And, and who's from, who, who are the, the teachers? We have Math for America teachers, but teachers in general. We have a bunch of teacher, math teachers out there. That is, that is really fantastic to see. So um, I, th I hope we have something for, every, and for everybody in this talk. 
And I also have one more promise, which is I think this might be the only talk this week in DC um, where the following word is only used once, sequester. <laughs> there we go. Um, so there's some main points to this talk. And there are main points for the left side of your brain, sort of the, the medical side, as well as for the right side. For, from the left side, here are some of the points we're going to talk about. Um, and I really want to talk about math ex explaining and predicting things. Um, and for the right side of your brain, you know, a lot of instrument sounds, a lot of music can be explained, can be better understood with mathematics. And that's really the, the big point here, is that math can help us understand music, and music can help us understand math. So that's the really main point that we're getting at today. Um, and it's a, it's a talk in three parts, right? So we're, um, we've got symphony in a single note, we've got bridges, wine glasses, and the Bay of Fundy, and then something about Bach. Um, but since this is musically related, um, and we're going to have music throughout this, I, I think it really makes more sense to think of this as in three movements. And so at the conclusion of every movement, we've chosen a piece, so we have a Vivaldi trio. And at the conclusion of every movement, we'll play another movement from the Vivaldi trio um, to sort of wrap up that part, and then we'll move on to the next part. Um, and there'll be, for the musicians out there, I've marked some things for you um, that are always in italics, and, and just so you know. I know that's always an issue at classical music concerts. So, so um, Aaron, I need your help with this. So uh, we, we need to talk about vibrating objects, a string or an air column or things like that. Um, and you might think that when anything vibrates, you just get sort of a sine wave. And we can check that. And I have a lovely little program here where we can record any sound. And we're, we're going to record a little bit of Aaron here. And now if you think this is a sine wave, you could zoom in and you could see, hmm, that doesn't really look like a sine wave um, at all. And in fact, you can do this lovely thing um, mathematically you, uh, with this program. We can uh, look at the spectrum. So if we plot the spectrum of this, you can see that it isn't just one peak. It's not just a sine wave at one place. Um, it's all of these different peaks. You have different peaks and you have them at different frequencies here on the bottom. And this is called the overtone series. Um, and any instrument that plays any of these notes has some sort of overtone series. And that's the overtone series for this particular flute. Now, one of the things you'll know is that, um, is that you have different patterns for the heights, but almost all of the instruments we have have at least the frequencies the same. And they have different patterns of heights, and that's how we can tell different instruments apart. I can play that same note on a violin, but you could tell it was a violin and not a flute by the overtone patterns. Thanks, Aaron. So those are the overtones. And there are a lot of different frequencies involved. Um, and we need to know a little bit about how they're related. Um, and you know, mathematicians, like when you're, teaching, when you're teaching mathematics, it's really important to get different representations, right? So mathematically, we have things like the graphical representation and the algebraic representation, things like that. Um, here, we can represent these overtones in a couple of different ways. So we could hear these overtones. Yvonne, you want to help us out? We can hear the, the pitches of the overtones. She can play them for us. That's really much better on cello. I can't get nearly that many on, on a violin. <laughs> um, but we can also see these things visually. And, and I do need a, a hand again, Aaron, for this. Um, we can see how these overtones look visually. And a, we have a jump rope that's going to help us. So um, Aaron, you, you're going to do the jumping. Yeah, that's great. Uh, <laughs> Don't take a step back. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so we, can see these, we can see the different vibrations. And maybe, Yvonne, you can play along with yeah. us. So, so here's the fundamental. And really, this is the full string vibrating back and forth. And then the next one she's going to play, that's the string moving like this. And so we really have the string is split in two. And you'll notice there are a couple important things. There's what mathematicians call a node in the middle. And there are two places called anti-nodes. There are two places where the, where the string is actually horizontal. Right? You see those two places, the peaks? Um, and it doesn't stop there. I think Yvonne's going to beat us in how many she can get. <laughs> Here we go. There's thirds. There's thirds. And so somehow the string is vibrating in three places. We have two nodes. And we have three places where there are anti-nodes where the string is horizontal. <laughs> oh, we had it there. Let's have it. There we go. Well, there's four. There's four in there. <laughs> She's just showing off. Mm -hmm. 
But I also want to look at these overtones mathematically. And so we're going to look at that, and that involves things like this, and this is the wave equation. So, um, so here's the mathematics we need, and we need to really look at a function, and the function is defined, um, it's u of x and t, and u of x and t is going to look at sort of the, um, the, the displacement for position x and time t. We're going to think about our violin string like that, and then we're going to do some calculus. And, oh, you know what? I forgot. Yeah, we're, we're getting to the presto part of this. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the marking here. So I don't actually want to go through this mathematics really slowly for you, but I do want to talk about the ideas involved. And in fact, I want to point out that when you do this analysis on a, on a violin string like this, or a cello string, um, what, all you're using is some basic physics facts and Newton's law. You're really just using the force equals mass times acceleration. And when you use that, you get what mathematicians call a wave equation. And there are boundary conditions on this wave equation, and those are going to be really important tonight. So I want to talk about those a little bit. Um, on the string, the string never moves here at the bridge, and it also never moves down here. This is called the nut of, this, of the instrument. And so because of that, we have these boundary conditions that u of 0 and t and u of l of t are always 0. And then we have some other initial conditions that might be, you know, you pluck the string, and you see what happens with that. But the boundary conditions are going to be really important. So those are the boundary conditions. And the goal mathematically is to try to solve this differential equation, this partial differential equation. And the goal of that is to predict the future. You know, a lot of mathematics is developed to, to really understand, to model the world, and then to be able to predict the future. I think we, we miss that in a lot of math classes. You know, it seems to me that when I was taking a lot of my math classes, the goal wasn't something so grand as to predict the future. The, the goal was more like to get through chapter four. I, I, you know, call me crazy. I think predicting the future is a lot more exciting than getting through chapter four, no matter what chapter four is. Um, so then we can understand, if we can solve this, then we can really understand um, the overtone series and... Um, yeah, and there's a lot of mathematics involved, and it would take several semesters, you know, differential equations, after you get through calculus, we need differential equations, we need a whole lot of stuff. And so, there's a lot of math that we're not really going to talk about, but here's the solution. And I want to point out a couple of things about this solution. Um, so, there are some very familiar things, no matter what your level of mathematics is, that you see in high school. You see sines and cosines. Um, I want to point out that the solution depends on a number of things. It depends on L, the length of the string. It depends on rho, which is really the mass, or mass per unit length of the string. Um, and it also depends here on the tension, how tight we pull these. And it, all three of those things are really important. The AK, if you know some more mathematics, these are the Fourier sine coefficients um, for any function where you start off. And so we can predict the future. <laughs> Yay, math! That deserves a little bit more applause. Yay, math! All right. <laughs> So what does this equation tell us? This equation tells us things, right? It tells us that these strings do have overtones. Notes on a string, just like notes on Aaron's flute, have overtones. And we're going to hear more than just one frequency. It's not a simple sine wave vibrating. It's much more complicated than that. And we see that because it's a summation of many different terms. And we see that these frequencies are predictable. And there's a, an equation here that predicts exactly what the frequencies of these are. The fundamental, the note that we hear, is given by that equation. So when Yvonne plays something on her cello, something lovely, I'm sure. <laughs> that, when, she, when she plays a more complicated piece on her cello, what she's really doing is altering this equation. She's altering the length of the string. She's altering the, uh, the tension of the string. And she's altering the weight by moving to the four different strings. So... Yeah, if you, you also the speed of the bow, there's yes. lots, of, lots of different things, but. It's an infinite number of variables that you can play with. <laughs> so she's just playing with this equation when she does this. You're thinking through that every time, right? Totally. Of course. <laughs> And with each note, you're hearing multiple different frequencies. And the relationship of those frequencies is just the, the fundamental, and then two times the fundamental, three times, on and on. If you look at the reciprocals of those, you get the wavelengths. And the wavelengths are the wavelengths usually called lambda, and then lambda over 2, lambda over 3, lambda over 4. You know, if you've had calculus, you've probably seen a series like this. It's the harmonic series. So many people out there are teaching calculus and never teach their students where that comes from. It's the harmonic series because it's the harmonics on a violin string or a tube of air like that. Um, and that's where they're coming from. 
So this, is, this table gives all of these, and I, I'm going to ask Yvonne to play through these um, on an A string, if you could. This gives all of the overtones, or at least the first nine here through here. <laughs> so that was, let's hear the fundamental first, the whole string there. And then the next one. And that's an octave above. And then an E. And then back to an A, and another octave up. A C sharp. An E. That one's really interesting. That note is not on our 12-note scale in Western music. That has implications for piano tuning. And there's the B. That's very nice. Um, I do want to point out something really important here. And so, uh, so we're going to go through this next bit a little bit slower. So the mathematics of a vibrating tube of air turns out to be exactly the same as the mathematics of a string. And this is, a, this is sort of an amazing thing, right? It's the same math in both of these. And in fact, the, the mathematics that you need, the wave equation, it's exactly the same math you need in order to understand the energy levels of an electron when you're studying quantum mechanics. This is, this is just an astounding thing. But it comes up in mathematics all the time. You know, even when we're really young, you learn how to do addition, right? You can, and, and maybe the first thing you learn how to do is add apples. And you, so you learn this addition. You're like, this addition is great. I can add two piles of apples. And then you find out you can add other things. You can add fish. You can add cinnamon rolls. You, you can add spark plugs, right? Addition. Like, once you know the sort of abstract idea of addition, like, you can apply it in all of these different places. This is a really wonderful thing about mathematics. Like, once you have, um, once you have algebra that can solve some problem in biology, that same algebra can solve some problem in economics or archaeology or any of these fields. It's a really amazing fact about mathematics. The abstractness is a wonderful thing for mathematics. It allows us to be applied in any of these different fields. In fact, um, Poincaré, Henri Poincaré, said mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. <laughs> this is a really wonderful quote. It goes to the heart of the abstract nature of mathematics. So, if you change the math, what's going to happen? So, um, so, I want to look at this tube, right? So, here I have a tube. It's much like... Uh, Aaron's flute. That's ah. probably the same price. I appreciate that. <laughs> right, so here's a tube. Here's a tube. And I can, do you know you can play the tube? Right, so here's the tube. Right? And so um, you can imagine that if I made the tube longer, it, it would be a lower note, right? And if I made the tube shorter, like a piccolo versus a bassoon, right? it'd be, it would be a much higher note. Um, and so, um, but I have a question for you. If I close the end and then hit it, do you think the pitch will go up or down or stay the same? So uh, I, let's vote, right? Um, so <laughs> here's, here's, the, so here's, here's the note. When I close the tube and then play it again, uh, who thinks the, the pitch will go up? Uh-huh. Good. Who, who thinks the pitch will go down? Um, and who thinks the pitch will stay the same? Wow. And who didn't vote? <laughs> Good. So, um, all right, you ready? So, here we go. So, here's the, right? And then we close the end and, oh. You know, <laughs> I did say that mathematics does this wonderful thing. It, like, predicts the future, right? Yeah, so, wh let's see if we can predict the future. Let's see what happens. You see, um, the open-ended tube, like that, it's, it's really, um, it's just like the, the analysis on the violin string. And so when we do that analysis, we have the same boundary conditions. It's zero. Here, our function u of x and t, it's no longer the position of the string. It's actually the air pressure. And it drops to zero. And by zero, we mean atmospheric pressure. And it drops to atmospheric pressure at both ends because it's open on both ends. It is open on this end. And I'm not covering the entire thing when I hit it. I'm just covering part of it. So it's open on both ends. And so... Uh, the, the fundamental frequency you see is, is it's a sine wave where it's zero at both ends and it hits a maximum right in the middle. And so that's what we get on this open-ended tube. And now, if we close one end, well, 
So if we close one end, the boundary conditions are going to change. And so now on this right end, on this open end, this is still going to be open, but on the, it's going to have to go to zero on that end. But on this end, it's no longer going to drop to atmospheric pressure. And if you work through the mathematics and, and go through the fluid dynamics, what you find is that the function has to be maximal at this end. And so that's the change in the boundary conditions. At one end, it's going to go to zero. It's fixed. On the other end, it's going to be, it's going to be maximal. And so we're going to get a, a waveform that looks like that. So what does that mean musically? So if you think about it, we have the open-ended tube up there and then the half-closed-ended tube. Um, and if we compare their wavelengths for the open-ended tube, we need to get the fundamental looking something like that, whereas for the closed-ended tube, it looks something like that. And if you try to compare these wavelengths, you could complete that one, and you notice that for the closed-ended tube, it's a much longer wavelength. You know, longer wavelengths are associated with the bigger instruments. And therefore, when we get that, the closed-ended tube, it should, be, it should be lower. It should be much lower in pitch. In fact, when you double the frequency, you should get something which is roughly an octave lower. Right? So musically, we should get something that's an octave lower. If you half the frequency, if you double the wavelength. Thank you. So, um, so you ready to test? So here's the open-ended tube. And we're supposed to go down about an octave. There we go. Yay, math. So, but, so really, why, why do we care about this? You know, so this is an interesting thing. This comes up in music. And in fact, we know something that, very much about, about instruments that's related to this. You see, flutes are open-ended tubes, but clarinets are closed at one end. There's no air escaping on the mouthpiece of a clarinet. Uh, the, the lowest note, of, what's the lowest note you can play? Let's hear it. It's right around 250 hertz. The lowest note a clarinet can play is much lower, 165 hertz. You need that note to play like the, the opening of, of Rhapsody in Blue, right? The low clarinet, do 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 on and on up. A clarinet can play that low. A clarinet and a flute are about the same size. A clarinet plays so much lower in part because it's closed on one end. If you compare these, right, so you have, there's the wavelength, there's what it looks like on a flute, and that's what it looks like on a clarinet. You also have this thing about the higher overtones. And this has to do with something that's called overblowing. You want to tell us about overblowing? Sure. So basically, the flute uh, is, is a one octave instrument. Uh, we play, and our keys give us one octave. And everything above that, we overblow. So overblowing is just basically playing up on harmonic theory. So would you like me to play the harmonic theory? Yeah. Let's see, if, let's see if Aaron can play the harmonic series. Um, and please get as many notes as Yvonne did. When you listen through that, the mathematics is the same as when Yvonne does that and goes up the scale. And in fact, it's the same as if you have an electron that's going up and up in different energy levels. And I think that's really an amazing thing. But the mathematics here is predicting the following thing about overblowing a, a flute versus a clarinet. You see, the flute, when you overblow, you get the next function that you could fit where it's zero at both ends. And the next function looks like that. And if you compare, the wavelength here is half of the original wavelength. And so the flute you're going to overblow up exactly an octave, right? You're going to overblow half the wavelength, which will be up an octave. And if you look over here at our clarinet, the clarinet, if you look, if you try to compare the wavelength of the next overtone that you hear with the original one, it's one-third. And so this mathematics is predicting that a clarinet should not overblow an octave, but it should overblow up an octave and a fifth. If we put these on a, on a, on a staff, they look like this. The flute should be overblowing this. And if you go up and up, that's what the overblown flute should sound like. Whereas a clarinet is going to skip the, the second one, and it's going to skip the fourth one. You're going to get only the odd terms. And so I really want to focus on those first two. Um, and we have some help here um, via video. We have Paul Sagan, who plays clarinet for the National Symphony. But let's hear overblown flute again.
And there you hear the octave that we would have. And now the mathematics is saying that when Paul overblows this note, he should overblow not that octave, but higher than that, another fifth. You hear he's overblowing, uh, he's overblowing again. Yay, math. Math is doing fairly well tonight. Um, <laughs> so there are other tricks you can do with a flute. Um, and so be, we have this, oh, this closed-end versus open-ended thing. So you might think that if I close the other end of a flute, we would go up a, an octave, right? So play your lowest note, and let me... Right? It, it doesn't really work, and there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is it's really hard to vibrate that low on, on a flute, but play a different note. Isn't that a wonderful magic trick? So, <laughs> mathematically what's going on is when he plays any other note, he has a hole open on his flute. And so the entire interesting part is going on between the mouthpiece and wherever that hole is. And stuff down here doesn't matter so much. But we can show you this closed-ended thing if we remove most of the flute. <laughs> there we go. There's the octave we get from a closed-ended tube. <laughs> yeah, it's out of tune. There's a really interesting reason for that. If you, if you want to ask me about that later, we'll talk about why that's a slightly <laughs> out-of-tune octave. Um, there's another way to hear sort of the overtones. The overtones, this is the symphony in a single note, right? So when you hear a single note, you're going to hear many different frequencies. And one of the ways you can do that are with harmonics on a string instrument. And so Yvonne's going to show us these. You see, um, if you were to stop the string halfway up, you would get this interesting thing. I don't mean that we would grab the string halfway up. So if Aaron and I were rotating this, this jump rope up here, I mean somebody would come up here and just sort of lightly touch the string right in the middle. You want to demonstrate this for us? Right? So she's just touching it in the middle. And in fact, we could predict that. You see, if we touch the string in the middle and we ask which of these modes could the string vibrate in, it can no longer do this big jump rope thing. And it also, but it can do the next one. Remember the next one had a node right in the middle? If you touch the string right in the middle, there'd be no problem. You could continue that. The third one did have, it was moving in the middle. In fact, it had a maximum point in the middle. But the fourth one had a node. And so when you do that, when you touch the string right in the middle, what you're really hearing is exactly just the even parts of the original overtone series. Go ahead, let's hear it one more time. So you're hearing just the even terms of that. Now, we don't have to just do it at one half. We could do this at one third. So we could stop, and we could think through the mathematics. You know, if we stop the string here, you won't hear any fundamental or the next overtone, but you will hear this one. And that's what you hear. You hear the octave and a fifth above. You can do it at either end. Oh, yeah. So this is a really interesting fact. <laughs> if you think through the math, it doesn't matter if you stop the string one-third of the way or two-thirds of the way up the string. You can sort of think, see the symmetry on the string up there. And that's saying that we have two different places to play the same note. Let's hear that again. It's exactly the same note. And here's the thing. Like, you get the same sound, and string players show off with this. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I could play that by doing... But it doesn't look as cool. <laughs> And if you go way up here, then it gives you the opportunity to go. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> Violinists do this too. And, and you guys just played the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, right? Right, so last week they were playing the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. And in the third movement, um, the violinist is supposed to hit the following note. And the violinist has a choice, right? Either this or up there. Now, which one looks better? Yeah? <laughs> right? And so here's, here's the easy way. Like that. That's the easy way. <sighs> <laughs> Let's just move on. No. And I'll, sure. No, here, here I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, so here, I'm going to try to hit that one, two thirds, like all the way up here instead of there. And it's just for show. Like that. Mm. Mm. 
So here are the main themes that we've covered in this first movement, right? So we're talking about instruments playing overtones and that you can hear the different overtones if you work at it. Um, you can control the pitch in, in, in predictable ways, and there are equations that do that. And so we want to conclude this first movement by playing a little bit from a Vivaldi concerto. It's originally written for oboe, recorder, and continuo. Is that right? Bassoon. Bassoon. And so instead, we're going to play it for, uh, for flute, violin, and cello. <laughs>
Thanks. On we go to movement two. Movement two, bridges, wine glasses, and the Bay of Fundy. What do those three things have in common? You know, the thing that they have in common is resonance. And that's what we're going to talk about here in the second movement. Um, so for winds, you know, really, we're, we're, I'm sorry, we're done. <laughs> um, but for strings, resonance is really important for strings. You see, it's not just about the vibrating strings. If we st stop with the mathematics of a vibrating string, it's not going to sound very good. And, and it's important the box really resonates, and that's really important. And you can demonstrate this in a couple of different ways. The, the, um, one way we can do this is we have practice mutes that you can play. And so if you, have, if you take a practice mute, that's what it is. And all we're doing here is we're adding weight to the bridge. And what that's doing is it hasn't changed the string at all. The analysis we did in the first movement still holds perfectly well. But now the bridge is not going to transfer as much of the energy to the resonating box. And here's what it sounds like. That's much quieter, right? And so you don't have the resonating box. In fact, we can do something a little bit radical because Yvonne has what's called a Practice cello. You want to show us show us what this thing is? It's horribly out of tune, but I can still demonstrate it. <laughs> As you see, it ha gosh, that doesn't help. It has no body. <laughs> so mathematics would predict. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just the string. That's what the string alone with the bow sounds like without the resonance of the body. The resonance here is really important. And so resonance is very important for a lot of musical instruments. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Now, um, mathematical resonance is incredibly complicated. And, and we're not going to go into the actual mathematics of, of resonating bodies like that. Um, but I want to show you a simpler example. Um, and in order to, to show you that, this has to do with harmonic motion. So springs and things like that, there's a lot of swings in the, in the playground or simple harmonic motion. And so we're going to go to Mathematica. Now, what I'm going to show you with this demonstration isn't the actual mathematics of a, of, um, of a resonating instrument. But I'm going to make an analogy here, and it's a, quite a good one with resonating body. So here's Mathematica. And what we have here is we have a vibrating string. You can think about this as a note. So maybe if we pluck, if you pitch a note, but you notice that that sort of died away after a while, right? And so we should add that to our model. And so that involves damping. And so we're going to move this slider over here. And now you can see that now this model it works well. It sort of damps. It goes away a little bit. Let's hear that one more time. And it sort of decays away. Now, that's not normally how you hear a cello. Normally, you hear it with a bow, right? Right. And what that is is that's a driven system. And so we're going to drive this a little bit. We're going to drive this system. And now what we're going to do is we're going to vary the frequency with which we drive this. And so you could drive this slowly or quickly, um, depending on things. And if you watch the sound there, you'll see that there's a frequency here. Oh, look at that, right? So if we hit exactly that frequency, the system um, resonates really nicely. If we go too far, it doesn't resonate so much anymore. And in fact, uh, let's put this back at its nice peak, where it resonates a lot. Um, that's hard to demonstrate on, on a cello because it's hard to drive it at different frequencies. Your bow, there's a Helmholtz motion is what it's called. Your bow really drives it at whatever the frequency is. But I, I, I borrowed my daughter's toy. <laughs> you think Ellie will forgive me? Right, so um, I want to show you this. I want to show you what's going on. You see, everything has a resonant frequency, including this toy. And if I, if I turn this slowly back and forth, I'm driving the system. But I'm not driving the system at its resonant frequency. I need to find, if I go a little bit faster, oh, you see that? I'm not turning it any more than I was before. I'm just turning it more quickly. I'm turning it at a different frequency. Now, interestingly, if you go past the resonant frequency, I'm going to go a little faster. The balls hardly move at all anymore, right? And if I slow back down again to the resonant frequency, I'm not doing really any more work. I'm just turning it at the right frequency. At the right frequency, this thing really resonates nicely. Now, the hard thing about string instruments is we don't want a cello that just resonates at one frequency. That would be sort of uh, um, that would be really frustrating. We want uh, these wooden boxes have to resonate at a whole range of frequencies. They have to sound good at all of these, and that's what you do when you buy an instrument, right? Right. <laughs> so, walk us through what it sounds like when you're when you're really trying out a cello for the first time. 
Well, almost every cello, even a really inexpensive one, will sound really good on the open strings, just the vibrating strings. But you want it to sound even across its whole range. So what does it sound like, for instance? Does it still sound, you know, wonderfully throaty, like a great alto? Or does it sound like somebody choked it? So that's one of the tests that I always put an instrument through. And you want it to play loud, but you also want it to play... You want it to resonate beautifully, even even softly. So some those are some of the different things that you, you look for. And mathematically, what's going on is we're looking for a box that resonates nicely, not just at one frequency, but at all of these different frequencies. No matter how you drive this, you want it to resonate nicely. So that's some resonation that we have, some resonance. Um, now, you can have some problems with resonance. Um, and. There have been problems over, over the years, right? So you see these resonance. So uh, the Millennium Bridge had resonance problems when they first tried to open it. And the problem was that the resonating frequency, side to side motion for the Millennium Bridge, was exactly the right frequency for people walking. And so what happened, and it was a really interesting mathematical problem because um, when it started to move a little bit, what do you do if you feel a little unstable? You, you, you spread your legs a little bit more which of course pushes the bridge more to the side and side. And because it was at that resonant frequency, the bridge really, it made people sick to walk on that. And they actually had to close the, that bridge for a couple of years. There are more, more drastic things. This bridge actually collapsed in France. Um, it collapsed from these sorts of resonant frequencies. And we can see these problems mathematically. You see, what we can do is we can take this and instead of drive it, we can drive it a little harder. We can drive it, we can increase the amplitude and you can see, as we increase the amplitude, the vibration gets wild, right? And so it gets out of control. And this is really what happens when, when resonance goes awry. Now, there is a famous example of, um, of this common misconception about bridges, right? You know the Tacoma Narrows Bridge? Right, so people think this, this was a resonance thing. It wasn't actually of a wind speed. You know, I think when I was in high school physics, my teacher told me the wind was blowing at exactly the right speed. It wasn't a wind speed resonance thing. It was something called aeroelastic flutter. If you take a piece of paper and blow on the edge, you get to see it flutter like that. That was more, that was closer to the phenomenon that took down the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So we can also get resonance to go awry in these ways on, on other things. So here's, um, you know, if you've seen Mythbusters, you've seen somebody get resonance to go awry on, on a wine glass. And if you watch this, the first thing that somebody does is they clink the wine glass to find the resonant frequency of the wine glass and then sing at exactly that frequency. Um, the Bay of Fundy. The Bay of Fundy is another system exactly like this. The Bay of Fundy has, oh, who's been to the Bay of Fundy? Yeah, so the tides of the Bay of Fundy are 55 feet. It's just amazing to just watch these tides go in and out. And so um, what's going on with these tides is that the Bay of Fundy has a resonant frequency, and it happens to be exactly the resonant frequency that the tides come at. And that has to do with the moon going around. So it means that you know, if the Bay of Fundy were 100 miles longer, it would have a different resonant frequency, and you wouldn't see these, these big tides. Or if the Earth turned a little bit slower, you wouldn't see these huge tides on the Bay of Fundy, but then all of a sudden the driving force would be the, the exact resonant frequency of some other bay somewhere else in the world, and you'd have huge tides there. Um, on string instruments, you also see these, uh, these examples where resonance goes awry. And these are called wolf tones. You want to show us a wolf tone? I'll try to find one. My cello doesn't have a very strong one, but I usually have one spot. <laughs> I do have a, a wolf tone on my violin, so let me see if I can find the wolf tone on my... If I play a little bit less on, on a different note, no problems. It's resonance gone awry. I'm not doing anything. It's, it's a property of the actual thing. It's like these bridges. And so there are ways for the, for the resonance to go awry on musical instruments as well. Um, there's another thing you might have seen that, that's related to resonance, and that's Tuvan throat singing. So 
when, when you have, hear Tuvan throat singing, they're singing one note. And what they're doing is they're, they're putting their vocal tract in the right position to resonate one of the higher overtones. So to go back to the first movement, they pick one of those resonant overtones, and if they put their mouth in exactly the right position, one of those overtones will resonate. If you haven't heard it, I'll, I, I do this not very well, but you, so you, you sing one note, oh, and then you change the, the shape of your vocal tract, and you'll hear, the, you'll hear it changing. I'm still ch singing the same note. <laughs> and what's going on is, it, for each one of those, I'm bringing out one of the overtones of the, of the harmonic series. So this is always an important question to ask. You know, all this resonance stuff, some of this is cool, but there's a much more important reason why you should care about resonance, and that's... And that's because that's how we hear. So deep in your ear, there's a cochlea. And inside your cochlea, there's this, um, there's this substance called the, the basilar membrane, which winds its way down the middle of your cochlea. And it has different resonant pre frequencies at different places. And so when you hear, you're hearing the different frequencies in different places. Your ear is splitting a signal into its different component frequencies. This is a really amazing thing. Um, mathematically, what your ear is doing is a Fourier transform. This is a wonderful thing, right? So, you know, you've evolved to have a Fourier transform all tucked inside of your ear. It's really a wonderful thing. So, that's what we've talked about so far. Those are the main points, and that concludes the second movement. So, we're going to play for you the second movement of the Vivaldi Trio um, to conclude the second movement. Can I check this? Hang on. Now we go to the third movement. So this has to do with Bach, and I really want to, uh, to showcase this. This is a quote from Gottfried Leibniz, one of the two people who uh, really came up with calculus along with Newton. Music is a secret exercise in arithmetic of the soul, unaware of its active counting. He's saying that music has hidden mathematical structures in it, and you don't always get to see these mathematical structures. So in this third movement, we're going to uncover for you some of these mathematical structures underlying um, some music, especially Bach. Bach wrote some fabulous music, and a lot of it had mathematical structures. And we're going to talk about transformation. So when I say transformation, I mean something that changes something in some ways, but it leaves it alone in other ways. And we can transform objects, we can transform melodies, and that's going to be the key to connect these two. So you might see geometrical transformations. Like you can imagine reflections. You could reflect that picture of a grand piano 
over an axis. And you could reflect it over a, a vertical axis as well. You could also translate things. So you could take a picture and you could translate it. And I want to be clear about this. In all of these things, the transformations here is not the picture itself. It's how the picture is changing. And that's really important. So the study of these transformations mathematically is group theory. Group theory is really the language we use to describe these transformations. So uh, I know not of all of you have seen some, some group theory, so I'll give you some mathematical examples of groups. So here are the integers. I've only drawn out part of this infinite table, but the integers with addition form a group. You can add two things. Uh, importantly, there's an identity. The, the identity is zero. Um, and you can always get back to the identity. No matter what number you're at, you can add something to get back to zero if you're on the integers. Right? The, the inverse of five is negative five. You can also do other things with numbers. So here are the integers mod two. It's just evens and odds. And you can think of this as a group, and mathematicians do. So even plus an even is always an even, and even plus an odd is always an odd. Mathematicians have a name for this. This is called Z2, Z mod 2. If you're wondering where the Z comes from, it comes from German. The German call numbers Zahlen. And so they've t adopted the Z from that to, to stand for these. Now, we could do more interesting transformations. Here's, we could think about M1 being translating something up one unit, and then M2 up two units. You could also go down one, two units two units, things like that. And so then you would get a table that's very much like the table we just saw. It's just like the integers, except now instead of thinking of three as the number three, we're thinking of it as going up three things. And you can already see the connection to music, because you could take a melody, and you could just translate that melody up. Play it up a note, up another note. You can do all of those things. And so you already see a connection between the mathematical transformations and the musical ones. And if we do this, you, you can sort of do some arithmetic. M1 plus M2 is M3. So the result of going up one and then two more, the result of that is going three units up. And so this really has the same structure as, as Z. This is just another copy of the integers. Whereas if we did reflection, if we had the do-nothing transformation, just leaving the picture as is, or reflecting it over the x-axis, if we have those, what we get is just a table like this, Note that if you reflect something over an axis and then re-reflect it, you get back where you started. That's how you get this. And if you look closely, this has the same structure as the table that had evens and odds. Again, this is a mathematical connection between things that are not, at, on first glance, the same thing. But it has the same mathematical structure. If we use different uh, reflections, if we reflect not only around an x-axis but al also around a y-axis, we get this table, which is really interesting. It has some interesting properties, among other things. Each one of those transformations is its own inverse. If we reflect and then re-reflect, we get back to the identity. This is a mathematical group called the Klein-4 group, Z2 cross Z2. Now, um, here are some of the key mathematical figures in this story. Uh, Gauss, Galois, Klein. Galois has great stories to go along, especially with his death. But um, they did wonderful work. But composers were using similar ideas long before this. If you look at the dates, you know, Bach died in 1750. And so they were using structures which are really similar to group theory long before group theory ever was. And that's what we're going to look at today. So here's a melody. Let's, Aaron, can you play this for us? And we could think of that melody by itself without doing any transformations. Or we could think about inverting it. Here we're going to reflect it over sort of an x-axis. And so instead of going down, it's going to go up. And this is what it sounds like. Right? And we can actually start that on any note we want. We could reflect it over an, a line that's a little higher or a little lower. Um, we could also take the original melody, and instead of uh, playing it normally, we could play it sort of reflected around that vertical line, sort of back to front. And here, here's what it sounds like on cello. And finally, the last one we could do is we could reflect it around both axes. So you could take this last one and just invert it like that. Or you could take the second one and play it backwards. Or you could take the first one and do both transformations. And here's what it sounds like. And so those are the transformations on a melody. Now, the melody that we're playing is actually uh, something that's fairly famous. It's the bass line from the Goldberg Variations. So in the aria, in the opening of Goldberg Variations, the bass line on the piano plays exactly that melody. And that's what we're hearing. So if you put these transformations together with this melody, what you get is this wonderful piece. It's called the 14 Canons on the Goldberg Ground. 
And amazingly, it's a piece, an original piece of Bach that wasn't found until the 1970s. It was a single sheet of music tucked in a copy of the Goldberg Variations that we know Bach at some time owned. And the single sheet of music, I'll show you how he wrote it. He wrote it, they were like these little musical puzzles. He was able to write this beautiful music. It's six minutes of music all on just one sheet of paper. And this is what we're going to talk about for the last little bit here. So let's go to Canon 1. So here's the original Bach. I've cleaned it up for you, so it looks like this. And, and it's just a single line of music, but it's actually supposed to be a duet. And there's a clue for the duet. The clue is over here. I've cleaned that up for you. It's, it's a backwards clef with a backwards time signature. And that's telling you that somebody is supposed to play the same music backwards, right? So they're supposed to play it retrograde. And so here we've written this out. So Aaron, Aaron's going to play the melody first, and then Yvonne's going to join him by playing the same thing backwards. It fits together just like that. That's canon one. Here's canon two. Again, there's another clue. Again, it's a reverse one. So you're supposed to play this um, with, its, uh, with its retrograde. This is the inversion of the original melody. Um, and that's what Aaron's going to play. And then um, Yvonne's going to play that retrograde inversion. So she's going to play that one backwards as well. little piece. In the third one, there's an interesting twist on this. Um, it's the melody and an inversion. Um, and you see the inversion here. You see a clap that's sharp. And the only way that sharps make sense is if you're upside down. Um, but there's this other trick. You see, there's, there's just a sign here, a del segno here. And what that's telling you is that the second player isn't supposed to start at the same time. The second player is supposed to start a little bit late. So let's hear what that sounds like. Again, Bach is using these wonderful transformations to, to write wonderful little music. We need another transformation before we get to the last one. The last of these uh, is one of the most beautiful ones. And the other transformation we need is something called augmentation and diminution. Augmentation is just playing something twice as slow. So instead of playing things very fast, it's playing them more slowly. And then diminution is the opposite of that, all by a factor of two. So I think all the half notes become quarter notes or, or the reverse of that. In Canon 14, he, he combines these transformations into this wonderful little bit. Um, so I'll play this. This is probably best on a violin. So uh, the, the only line that's written in Canon 14 is this line. That's all that's written. And in fact, in this one, the only clue is in the title. It says up here, and, and uh, we can translate that, it says, a canon in four parts with augmentation and diminution. That's all you get. And then it's a puzzle. You have to figure out what the four parts are. So let's walk through these. So there's the original, and there's the line that you just heard me play. The second line is augmented by a factor of two. You see the 16th notes are now eighth notes. Um, and it's inverted and transposed, and so it's down a bit. And then the third line is augmented again. Now we're at quarter notes, and it's transposed again. And the last one is augmented again. Now we're at, we're at half notes, and it's inverted and transposed. And when you take this melody that he has, and you do this, you augment it eight times, and then invert and transpose it. Here's what it sounds like. Yeah, the bottom one. The bottom one. <laughs> Get the original melody, the aria from the Bach um, Goldberg Variations. So we want to play for you Canon 14, and uh, Yvonne's really doing a, a great duty here. She's going to play the bottom two parts. Maybe. So here's, here's Canon 14. <laughs> Mm. Mm. 
it's always just amazing to see that all from one line of music. To, that's amazing stuff. Now, that was, a, that was a melody that Bach wrote and then used these transformations to create beautiful music. You know, what if, could he do this with any melody? And we actually found the answer to that. You see, he went to visit the King Frederick the Great um, in, in 1747. And King Frederick the Great said, on the spot, he said, I want you to improv I want you to write me a nice fugue, sort of like these, based on the following melody. And, can you play that for us, Aaron? Here's the melody. Here's the melody. It was like he was playing a trick on Bach or something. Here's the melody. Imagine that that didn't fit together as well as, as the, you know, the, the melody that Bach wrote. Here's the amazing thing. Bach improvised a three-part fugue on the spot using the king's melody. And, and later he went, back and he, he went back and he worked with it for a while. And then he could write a six-part fugue using exactly this melody. He was really amazing at it. So um, we want to play you just a, one little part from that. This is the canon perpetuous. And I want to listen for the, for the melody. Aaron has it first. You want to hear? Here's the melody. And I have that same melody, except it's inverted. And here's what it sounds like. And now Bach fits them together. This is all based on this melody that he was given. And here's the canon perpetuous. Again, the main theme of this third movement is that Bach was using transformations in, in these fugues and these canons. And you know, these were all relate, very much related to group theory. You know, in some sense, Bach really predicted the future of, math, of mathematics. <laughs> Yay, Bach! All right. <laughs> so again, uh, we've heard three different sort of symphonic equations, right? We've talked about overtones, we've talked about resonance, and now we've talked about transformations. Um, and the main point through all of this is that music helps us, uh, math helps us understand music, and music helps us understand math. And that's really what we want, the point we want to get across to you today. So we're going to close with the last movement of the Vivaldi. Um, and while you're listening to this, I want you to think about all of these things that we've talked about. I want you to think about how a single note that any one of us is playing has all these layers of overtones. I want you to think about how especially string instruments are using resonance to make these things sound much warmer. Um, and I want you to think about the, the, the mathematics underlying the structure of this piece. I want you to listen for the arithmetic of the soul that's hidden in this mathematics, in the music.
Stand up. Stand up. Thank you very much.